welcome to the June 2021 edition of the Economist Intelligence Unit's Global Outlook video. My name is Agathe Demare, and I'm the Global Forecasting Director at the Economist Intelligence Unit. I'm joined today by Kaylin Birch, our Global Economist and Lead US Analyst, and Andrew Vitoriti, who's our Lead for Commerce and Regulation. And today we're going to discuss US fiscal stimulus and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on remittances. So let's start with you, Kaylin, to discuss U.S. fiscal stimulus. We've seen some pretty extraordinary amounts being announced by the Biden administration. How much is actually likely to pass, do you think? I think this is maybe one of the biggest wild cards in our economic forecast, actually, because there's a, still quite a big question mark remaining around what strategy the administration follows to push through to Congress, and that'll have a big impact on how much spending we actually see. Um, our core forecast is that we'll see probably up to about two trillion uh, in investment of the total proposed four trillion. So uh, effectively, a halving of the administration's um, pie in the sky plans that we saw announced in March and April. April. And we think that's probably likely to come to a vote around the time of this September, October, so just before the start of the next fiscal year. Um, and that bill that ultimately gets through Congress, we think, is likely to be mainly focused on infrastructure spending uh, and mainly around hard infrastructure and manufacturing, the areas that have the strongest bipartisan support and that'll be easiest to get through Congress. But I should caution that to say, but still by no means easy to get through Congress. Um, a quick note on the legislative strategy. So at the moment, the administration is quite focused on obtaining a bipartisan bill, and we think they'll stick with that plan, at least for the next month or so, as talks go through. Um, we haven't seen a huge amount of progress, but there is still quite a lot we think the Biden administration would like to get out of the bipartisan bill, saving kind of the option of, of bipartisan legislation for the second half of Biden's term, um, and trying to get a bill, again, that has the majority of support um, amongst the country and sticking with that original message that Biden very much wanted to put through. Of course, there's a very high chance that talks will fail. If they do, it'll likely hinge on Republicans' unwillingness at the moment to consider tax increases. But interestingly, we think no matter which way Democrats move to put this bill through Congress, either with Republican support or using the special budget reconciliation measure, it'll probably end up in either case at that lower roughly $2 trillion figure. Um, so there's still a lot to be worked out there. And we think still a bill of that, of that size will support growth of about 6% in 2020, really a remarkable figure, and 3.7% again in 2022. That's really above trend for the U.S., even after you factor out the impact of the recession in 2020. Pretty sure remarkable figures, um, as you say. And actually, we've seen in the media in recent days a lot of discussions around inflation being a risk potentially in the US. What does your forecast mean for inflation and consumer prices in the US? We do expect to see the fastest inflation um, that we've seen really in over the course of the last decade of about 2.7% in 2021. Um, really, that's sh showing signs that demand is outstripping supply um, in some sectors of the economy. But more broadly, we think that's probably going to be a one-off jump in inflation, likely around the expectation that the Fed has as well, that we'll see those supply constraints becoming a problem in 2021. We'll see prices rising primarily in sectors where there's a biggest mixed match between demand and supply. We're seeing that now in the automotive sector, but also in terms of airfare prices, for example, if airlines have had to cut their operations, cut their service lines. Now that demand is recovering, there's this supply um, and demand squeeze that we're seeing. So that's likely going to stay with us this year, but we don't see um, really any rationale to expect years of inflation kind of at that uh, excessive rate that might force the Fed to raise interest rates earlier than it currently expects. Um, now, an infrastructure bill would certainly boost investment, that would boost job creation and wages as a result. So there's certainly kind of the prospect for faster inflation, but overall, we think the recovery, while quite impressive in terms of headline numbers, will still be staggered enough that we probably won't see year-on-year -year inflation close to 3% um, for you know anything more than a one-off this year. Um, it'll be really important to keep watching inflation expectations, though. They've risen in recent weeks, and that could actually become increasingly anchored in the future. And it really is down now to kind of investor sentiment. So lots to keep an eye on. 
Thanks so much, Kayleen. I'm going to turn to Andrew now to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on migrant remittances. So migrant remittances are a very important source of income for many developing countries all around the world. They really matter. Let's start, Andrew, with a stage setting question, perhaps. What was the impact of the pandemic on migrant remittances? Well, the impact was quite bad, I got. Essentially, the pandemic created an environment that restricted the mobility of migrant workers, but also stopped up the flow of remittances across borders. Just to provide a couple of examples of how this all played out. So the lockdowns that many countries introduced last year to contain the spread of COVID shuttered sectors and industries where migrants tend to work, leaving them with less excess cash to send back home. Uh, the lockdowns also closed money transfer services at physical storefronts, both in migrant destination countries, but also in migrant origin countries. That's a pretty critical development since many migrants rely on these services. After all, the vast majority of remittances, uh, over 80%, in fact, are cash-based. And then, of course, there were travel restrictions, which, if anything, prevented would-be migrants from leaving home, taking up a job overseas, and earning an income that they then could send back, at least in part, to their families. Now, even amid this pretty negative climate, the actual impact of the pandemic on remittances last year was not as bad as many, including ourselves at the EIU had initially expected. The World Bank recently put out new estimates that global remittances fell by only 2.4% last year. That's a much better outcome than its original forecast of a 7% collapse and would mean that COVID's impact was less severe than what we saw during the global financial crisis in 2009 when remittances fell by 5%. So overall, again, we're looking at a, a still challenging environment for remittances last year, but one that wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been. And how about this year? Is there any hope um, at the end of the tunnel? Will you see a recovery in global remittance flows, do you think? Well, things are definitely looking more favorable. Uh, the World Bank is now expecting that remittances will actually increase by 1.5% this year. That's a big improvement from its initial projection of another 7% collapse and broadly in lines with our own new forecast, the EIU. But even with this rosier picture, it's very important to understand that there's enormous risk surrounding any potential recovery in remittances this year. In fact, we're still forecasting that many remittance receiving developing economies will see a decline in remittance inflows. For example, uh, we expect Bangladesh and Pakistan, which actually saw an increase in migrant remittance inflows in 2020. They'll see uh, a decrease in 2021. That's because many of the factors that fueled last year's increase for these countries were effectively one-offs and uh, won't be replicated. Just think about repatriations of savings by migrants who lost their jobs uh, overseas and then returned home. That was a dynamic that we particularly observed of migrants from Bangladesh and Pakistan working in the Gulf region. But um, even more generally, the factors that would be essential for enabling a global recovery in remittances, they're not likely to all fall into place this year. Even though we're expecting the global economy to recover this year and for the US economy to do the same, the recovery of other important migrant destinations in Europe and the Middle East, those recoveries are going to push out into next year. Uh, the recovery of many migrant employing sectors and industries will also be on the slower side. Just think of tourism and hospitality. And then there are considerable risks surrounding migrant jobs themselves. Many employers learn to operate around the pandemic with leaner staffs and more technological innovation like automation. And that only increases the likelihood that certain job profiles, including those held by migrants, might not return quickly or, or even at all. So what all this means again is that whatever recovery we do see in global remittances this year will be incomplete and could very well be modest. Thanks so much, Andrew, and thanks so much, Kayleen, for your thoughts. We're at the end of the video now. Please check our website, www.eiu.com, for our latest analysis. We've recently published a white paper on US fiscal stimulus that you wrote, Kayleen, and a white paper on global remittances and the impact of the pandemic on them that you wrote, Andrew. You can also check our Twitter at the EIU or our personal Twitter feeds. Thanks so much for joining and stay safe. Goodbye.